All right, hello uh, and welcome. So this video um, or series of videos, um, we're going to dive into a fairly theoretical topic um, of frequency domain uh, transforms or frequency-based analysis. So um, it, it, it can be a real rabbit hole trying to really understand, uh, especially qualitatively, what, what that means. Uh, but the, the good news is if you break it down, it's not too bad. And we actually as humans have a fairly good understanding of kind of this idea of frequency domain uh, transforms and frequent frequency domain analysis. So you may have heard of this concept of in DSP, where you may have seen code snippets called an FFT. Um, and we're going to learn about what an FFT is. And so it stands for fast Fourier transforms. Okay. Now, before we can kind of get to the meat of this, I got to back up a little bit um, and kind of explain, you know, how we get from, oops, let me grab a different color here. How do, how do we get there? So fast forward to transforms. Um, put a little horn here, transforms, FFT. So because to really understand the FFT, you need to know where, uh, kind of where these terms come up. First, we need the concept of transforms. Um, then we're going to look at what's a Fourier transform. And then, then we look at fast. So um, unfortunately, people start here at the fast part. Then they don't really get the Fourier part and the, the whole idea of a, a, a transform. So um, we're going to start this other way and kind of look at what this idea of a transform and uh, what, what a Fourier transform is and what it means to be fast. All right, simple enough. So let's go to another slide. And I like to use audio for a, a lot of, you know, signal processing examples because it's something we all understand. So, you know, let's say we have a person here. You know, I'll kind of draw them. I'm not an artist, but, you know, put eyeballs here. I'm getting big nose. There we go. So here's Bob. All right. Bob lives in the world, and Bob is constantly hit by sound waves. All right. Sound waves are generated, whether it be little birdies in the sky, you know, you know, little doggies barking, um, so on and so forth. But Bob is hit by sound waves. Now, Bob has sound sensors called his ears. All right. That makes sense. We all know what an ear is. Um, and so these waves are just perturbations of, you know, static pressure of, you know, air pressure that we kind of sense. So the sensor we have is the ear kind of picks up not absolute pressure, but it picks up what's called dynamic pressure, only changes in pressure. So if we were to make a graph here, I'm going to go time and we'll draw, say this is acoustic pressure P. You know, Bob is always being hit by these changes in pressure. Now, depending if this little birdie's tweeting uh, or if, you know, there's sound coming over here, maybe someone playing rock and roll guitar, you know, we, we have this uh, sound wave. So the eardrum and the tympanic membrane, you know, all this stuff in the ear is used to sense, um, to sense the sound, all right? And we call this sensor time domain. All right, because all that means is we could stick another device, say a microphone in there and measure pressure as well and get the same reading. And it shows some variable, in this case, pressure P, you know, over another variable time, T. Um, so it's time to me. But that by itself is kind of meaningless. So Bob inside, you know, has this gushy gray matter called, you know, a brain. While we certainly need the ear, you know, in the eardrum and all that to pick up the sound, it's the brain that does all the work of interpreting the sound. So it turns out the brain, while it does take this time domain information, uh, the brain really processes thing by frequency. And think about this. Whenever you listen to music, we usually describe music with really odd 
you know, very qualitative measures. You know, it's bright, it's uh, bassy, you know, it's rich. Well, it turns out almost every word we use is describing tone. You know, we talk about the low tones or the high tones, um, but we never describe really this time domain behavior. And the only time we do is we, we talk about time domain is that when we're trying to describe like length. So if we have a gunshot that's a quick pow, you know, our ears kind of pick this up and we get some sort of uh, sensation from, you know, quick changes, you know, in pressure. But when you really dig into that signal or any signals we listen to, we're, the brain is really extracting a lot of other information out of that. Um, and so the brain is actually doing something simpler to a transform, a fast Fourier transform. It's a brain transform um, where it's kind of looking at this signal let me just draw my axes here again. A little time, you know, an acoustic pressure P, and I'll draw this signal. I'll just go like this. So that's what we measure with the ear. But if we were to take a time slice, you know, from here to here, all right? Kind of the brain over time, and I'll draw this, this pressure still. If we take this time slice here, and I'll draw this down here. At different points in time, almost think of a sliding window, is our brain kind of dissects this signal, you know, and separates it into low tones and high tones. So the brain, and I'll draw this as just F for frequency, it might say, well, at this in this block of time here, or what I've drawn here, we might have a lot of low tone, you know, uh, a little bit of the mid tone, and maybe a lot more of high tone. I just completely made that up. Where as this time wave progresses, our brain is also interpreting this waveform and kind of doing this computation to kind of give us this sensation of kind of like low, medium, high. We kind of hear that, and, and that's very organic. We, we think about that. Now, the brain also picks up other time information. So let's say you had a waveform that was like POW. There's not much tonal information, but we can definitely feel it. We get a sensation. We hear it. Um, and it does a similar transform for that. But a lot of stuff, there, there, there's this concept of tone. And the, why that is, is that almost all processes that we see in the universe are kind of described, you know, by second or even order differential equations. You know, I can just write a differential equation. Uh, here, and they're almost always even order. For most of the processes that we interact with in the world, um, and actually I should draw the, you know, two over here. And, you know, that's incorrect. A mathematician would not like what I just did there, but that's okay. Um, there should be the two right here. And Alright, let's just redraw this so make mathematicians happy. So d squared x and we'll do it with respect to t so this is for differential um plus i don't know i'll make something up called alpha equals zero so the only thing i was trying to get at here is that most of uh the behavior we see kind of in the observable universe at human scales uh are even order differential equations there's actually a good reason now excuse me mathematically why it's even why it's even, um, but it is. So, well, it turns out uh, a lot of these equations over and over and over again, when you have a, t a second order time uh, component, that the solution always takes the form of kind of like an e to the j, you know, and I'll just say 2 pi ft in this case would be square root alpha but there's always like this e to the j 2 pi frequency times time and this might be a little different but really uh we use the complex exponentials and night for math but if we remember what's called euler's identity complex exponentials are written uh 
in the real and imagined part with cosine and sine. So what the, what is uh, happens is that almost everything uh, when there's a differential equation and there's like a second order time domain part, it's it's sine and cosine. That's what happens, um, and that's why so many uh, uh, vibration based stuff is sine and cosine because those are the solutions that differential equations of the universe is set up. So we're going to see a lot of sine and cosine. So that leads us next to the Fourier transform. All right, so there's this technique, um, or, you know, set of math called the Fourier transform. I'm going to write it out in kind of the mathy approach. But I don't want you to get too bogged uh, down with that. And um, I, I just want to kind of go through it qualitatively. So let's say we have a function and, you know, we'll call this function, you know, pressure. And it has a time argument. So we want to express that is a different function. And let's say it's pressure. But we want to know, our argument is frequency. That's what we want to plot along a different axis. So, so how do we get this? Well, uh, Jean-Baptiste Foyer figured it out. Um, and he did it out when he was trying to solve partial differential equations dealing with heat flow. Um, but he came up with this idea of the Fourier transform. So because sine waves kind of are everywhere, what we did is he said, what if you took you know, this time domain or... Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be time or uh, a variable in one domain and correlate it. And I'll explain what I mean is e to the minus j, 2 pi, f, t. All right. And by correlate it, you multiply these two functions and then you just sum them up. And how do we sum and kind of this analog domain, we go from negative infinity to infinity, which we know that kind of in the real world doesn't make sense because we don't have functions for all time and we don't care about all frequencies. But for for now, in continuous time world, this, this makes sense. Um, now, you might say, well, e to the j, that's weird. Well, what is that? Well, remember, Euler's identity says this is kind of looking at a signal or a, a, a complex number um, in polar format, but remember, e to the negative j is also j, you know, sine 2 pi f t and cosine 2 pi f t, all right? going to add those. Um, and that, so what, what we do in a Fourier transform is all we're doing is I'm going to use the word again, correlate a time domain, or I'll say a function in one domain, against a sine and a cosine wave, wave in a different domain, in this case, frequency. And all this correlation does is multiply two things and add it up to get a number that represents kind of how similar those two things are. If you take one function multiplied by another and sum up that result, you get a number, and that number, uh, you know, kind of represents how they're correlated. So a Fourier transform just correlates, you know, a function of time or one variable against sine and cosine waves. So what you get here, if P of T, you know, is equal to, you know, and this is a waveform over time, P of F is another function. I'll draw this one like in blue. That represents each of the amplitudes here. The amplitude of this wave at a point represents the amplitude of a sine wave of that, you know, of what that signal is correlated to. So this means that there's a strong component at one frequency, let's say 100 hertz, I'm just making that up, but it's not as correlated as, say, 200. Um, I'll draw this frequency, and this is time. All this is doing is showing us how well correlated 
uh, our original waveform is to these different frequencies. Now, the interesting part about a Fourier transform is it actually returns us something kind of complex value. We also can get what's called phase information because not only we're worried about um, uh, amplitude, we also want to know phase. Is how is that sine wave shifted in time? Had we only done a correlation against sine, we only get amplitude. Because we did J sine plus cosine, it turns out that's going to later give us phase. And we're going to see that later. That's important, um, is if there's phase shift to the components. So, so, so that's kind of like what a transform is. Now, it turns out, um, and this is kind of magic, is that you can take any function and represent it but with an, any other set of functions, as long as those functions are something called orthogonal. Now, it turns out you can also do what's called linearly independent, but orthogonal um, is, is, is kind of special. Um, so it turns out we can actually come up with a transform that doesn't correlate our signal with sine and cosine. We can pick any other waveforms in the world we want as long as they are orthogonal. Um, now, real quick, I, I, I want to uh, show you this because this is kind of important. Th that sounds kind of weird. What does it mean for a function to be orthogonal? Well, there's a, 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 a mathematical definition for orthogonality with integrals, but I want to show you a geometric way of looking at this that, that's kind of neat. Um, so let's let's take an x y axis. So I'm going to draw x and y. And I'm going to draw two points, and let's say this is 1, and that's 1. Well, in linear algebra, you kind of learn that, let's say you have a point in space. So I'm just going to draw it, like, you know, right here. And that point in space has a coordinate, some xy coordinate. And I'm going to say it's 0 0.5 comma 0 0.5. All right. Well, the reason we give it this, because it give it this coordinate, it turns out we write this coordinate in space as the sum of two other coordinates or two other vectors, one being 1 comma 0 and the other being 0 comma 1. All right. And what we do is, let me draw some arrows here. If we mix, you know, a little bit of the first, alpha of 1 comma 0, and I'll just draw this as beta of 0 comma 1, we can take what are called our basis vectors, combine them, and represent any other point in the plane. Now, you just might you might say, well, Eli, that's a really complex way to explain just the point in the plane. Well, here is the, here's the analogy. It turns out by saying orthogonal, what that means is, is that these two points um, is that they form a right angle. Now, that's a special case of something called linearly independent. By linearly independent, what that means is there's nothing we can multiply one of these basis functions by, or basis, to get the other one. So there's no number we can multiply 1 comma 0 to get the other one. That makes it linearly independent. Now, the next thing is, what does orthogonal mean? Now, orthogonal means geometrically 90 degree angle, but what that really means is if we were to correlate two orthogonal things, they are not correlated at all. There's zero. Because that what that essentially means is when they're orthogonal, there's nothing you could do to the one to make it turn it into the other. Now, this makes sense for geometry because we can extend this into the third dimension and add a z-axis. Um, but now how does this have to do with functions? Well, it turns out instead of thinking about geometric points, we do the same analysis with functions. And I'll draw one function there, 
And actually, let me do this. Um, let me just get a new. And I'll just draw this. Let's say we had this red function and this blue one. If Imagine these are just like points on this axis. By meaning orthogonal, meaning if we were to correlate this one and this one, the correlation would always be zero, meaning there's nothing you can multiply this function by to get this function. Well, what the Fourier transform does is it uses an infinite number of sine and cosine. So here's two, here's three. Um, what if we want fourth dimension? Well, you got to pop it out. That we sum up these orthogonal functions and we multiply them each by their own little number. Um, and then what we end up with is this other function. So we can, that's what that means is to decompose. And because, well, we use Fourier transform because sines and cosines exist you know, in nature, um, it turns out as long as we have orthogonal functions, we can expand any function into any other set of orthogonal functions. They could be square waves. You could actually, you can make square waves that are orthogonal. Um, so that's kind of neat. Now, if you're ever curious, there is actually a name for this, and I, I found this absolutely fascinating. Um, it's called the generalized Fourier series, or the generalized expansion problem. And here's the interesting part, is that we always learn about Fourier transform. Well, that is a small subset of, this is what Fourier actually did. Um, he came up with this, this, this generic approach. Um, and it's, it's kind of mathy, but what I want you to take away from is that not only can we decompose a waveform into sine and cosines, uh, we can decompose it into uh, anything, as long as those anythings are linearly independent um, or special cases orthogonal, because orthogonal ensures that um, you know each axis is very cleanly separated. Um, now, that's kind of like the background. So that's the transform. Let's go back to our original thought. That's the transform part. Um, if we can take any function and kind of correlate it to any other function um, to kind of get something new, a different way of looking at it. In the case of Fourier transforms, um, what that means is we can use sine and cosine. And because sine and cosines are everywhere. And when we talk about sine and cosine, remember that's where we get the concept of frequency. Now, the last step is fast. And we're going to start looking at that in the next video because we're already at 25 minutes. So, um, so tune in for the next video. This will give you something to think about. But from here, we're going to kind of move from this analog domain of looking at things in terms of, uh, you know, this infinite number of sine waves to a finite number, um, and then doing it with discrete time data. And then we'll kind of understand where the FFT comes from. So uh, I hope this is a good start, uh, and I'll see you next time.